Hi everyone, today we're going over chapter 8 of Physics for the MCAT, which covers light and optics. Chapter 8.1 is about the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic waves are known as transverse waves, which we discussed in the last chapter. So a transverse wave just means that the direction of wave oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. A very important equation in this section is that the speed of light, which is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, this is one of the most useful constants you can have memorized. Um, the speed of light is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. Th so this means that the frequency and the wavelength of any electromagnetic wave are inversely related. So if you have a higher frequency, you will have a lower wavelength. Something else that's important about this is that the shorter the wavelength of a wave, the more energy this wave will have. So on the very strongest side, we have gamma rays, and on the very weakest side, we have radio waves. You can see that the visible spectrum only covers a very small portion of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, but this is the portion we happen to be able to see. So this is from about 400 to 700 nanometers. It's important that this unit is in nanometers, because when you use this number in calculations, you'll generally be expected to convert this number into meters. So remember to multiply the value by 10 to the negative 9th in order to get the value in meters. It is fairly important to remember that the visible light spectrum goes from 400 to 700 nanometers. You'll sometimes be asked about particular colors, but as long as you know that it goes from 400 to 700, it's really easy to estimate the divisions between each color if you know the order that the rainbow goes in. A black body is the name given to an object that can absorb all visible light. So if all of the visible light is absorbed, then none of it is emitted, and therefore this object will have no color and it will appear perfectly black. A frequently tested topic is the relative energies of each of the colors in the visible spectrum. So as you can see, red has the highest wavelength, which means it has the lowest energy, and violet has the lowest wavelength, which means it has the most energy. We often refer to longer wavelengths as being red shifted and shorter wavelengths as being blue shifted. Chapter 8.2 is about geometrical optics, which is basically just the behavior of light as it reflects off of various surfaces or goes through different materials. We know that the electromagnetic spectrum undergoes rectilinear propagation, which just means that it goes in a straight line whenever it's in a homogeneous medium. And homogeneous medium just refers to the fact that it's not changing material. So if light goes through the air, that's a homogeneous medium. And if light goes through the water, that's also considered a homogeneous medium. But if you have light that crosses from the air into the water, that's no longer considered a homogeneous medium. And this is important because we can see light in a straight line. But when you look at an object such as a straw in a glass of water, um, it is no longer homogeneous medium, which is why the straw appears distorted and smaller. So one of the first laws that we'll learn about is the law of reflection. The law of reflection states that when light reflects off of something, then the angle that it hits the surface will be equal to the angle that it reflects back off of the surface. And this is in respect to a hypothetical line we draw called the normal. The normal is always drawn in 90 degrees to the surface that the light is reflecting off of, and in respect to the normal, the angle that this light approaches the surface is equal to the angle that it reflects back off of the surface. So theta 1 equals theta 2. Using this law, we can begin to understand plane mirrors, which are just flat surfaces where light can reflect. Plane mirrors can make two types of images. They can make real and virtual images. Real images are where the light converges where the image appears, so the image actually is where it appears to be. In general, this is going to be in front of the mirror. A virtual image is an image where the light converges somewhere else, so the light looks like it's somewhere that it's actually not. Here I've drawn an example of a virtual image. This person is standing over here to the left, and us as the observer were also standing to the left of the mirror. And so this person is emitting a bunch of light or a bunch of light is bouncing off of him and going to the mirror. So when we follow the rays of light that will bounce off of him, we see that it goes to the mirror and bounces back off the mirror. Or in the case of this ray, it goes to the mirror and it bounces back off the mirror this way. And this ray bounces this way and this ray bounces that way. And as you can see, all of these rays follow the law of reflection where theta 1 equals theta 2. 
And so us as the observer on the left, we don't see the rays of light that are emitted by this person. What we see are these rays that are coming back out. And our eyes will trick us, and when we see rays coming back out this way, we will follow the ray and we will think that they came over here because light generally travels in a straight line. And so we, where the image appears is over here behind the mirror, but as you know, there's nothing behind a mirror and this person is not actually behind the mirror. It just so happens that all of the rays of light appear to converge at this one spot here. An example of a real image is more tricky because a real image involves the light actually being on the same side as you and not behind a mirror. So an example of a real image could be when a movie is being played on a screen, then when you look at the screen you see an image and that image is also where the light happens to be. So that would be a real image. To be completely clear, the screen in the movie theater example is not the mirror, the screen is where the image is displayed. So what I meant by the movie theater example is that you have a light source and you have the screen. And light will bounce off of a mirror and then travel to the screen. And therefore, the screen and the light are on the same side, and you can see that the rays of light actually do converge on the screen, which is why this is a real image, because the light actually is where the image appears to be. However, in the case of a mirror, you would think that the light is behind the mirror, where the image appears to be, but the light is not behind the mirror. The light converges in front of the mirror. I spoke briefly about the fact that all of the rays of light must converge at the same spot in order to form an image. And this is important for an image to form. So if you were ever in high school where your teacher struggled to fiddle with a projector for a long time trying to get it to focus, this is because the projector must be placed exactly at the spot that the rays of light converge or else the image will appear blurry or the image won't form at all. Another type of mirror you'll see is called a spherical mirror or a curved mirror. Here I've drawn a curved mirror and as you can see, this curved mirror is part of a full circle. So if we extend this curved mirror out to a full circle, we can see that it has a certain center called the center of curvature, and the distance between the center of curvature to the mirror is called the radius of curvature. Half the radius of curvature is called the focal length, and this focal length defines the distance between the focal point and the mirror. This focal point lies along the same line as the, cent as the center of curvature, it is just half the distance from the mirror. The letter O, capital O, is used to denote the object, and lowercase o is used to denote the distance between the object and the mirror. Capital I is used to denote the image, and lowercase i is used to denote the distance from the image to the mirror. An interesting property of spherical mirrors is that they have an inside and an outside, where the inside is concave, or also known as converging, and the outside is convex, or also known as diverging. This is because if a ray of light approaches from the inside, it will converge toward the center, and if a ray of light approaches toward the outside, it will diverge toward the outside. We can use this equation here to solve for almost everything about mirrors. This equation states that 1 over the focal length is equivalent to 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance. And this is by definition equal to 2 over the radius, since the focal length equals the radius over 2. In order to use this equation, we have to consider several things about these variables. First, by definition, the object distance is always going to be positive, since we're going to consider everything from the point of view of the object. Therefore, when we think about the focal length as well as the radius, we think of the focal length and radius as in respect to the object. So if the object is on the concave side, this radius and this focal length will be positive. However, if we drew the object on the convex side, then the radius and the focal length will be negative because it's on the other side of the mirror. This is also true about the image. So if the image is a real image, we say that the image is going to be positive, and if the image is a virtual image, we say that the image is going to be negative. I think the distinction between the signs is where a lot of people get tripped up about optics, but I think it does make a lot of sense if you think about it. So the object is always going to be on the same side as itself, so the object distance will always be positive, and the focal length as well as the radius will always lie on the inside since the center of curvature and the focal point will always lie on the concave side of the spherical mirror. And therefore, if the object is on the convex side, the focal length and the radius of curvature must be negative because they're on opposite sides. And the sign convention for the image distance also makes a lot of sense because 
If the image is real, then it's positive, and if it's fake, then it's negative. Something else that's great about this equation is that we can also apply it to our plane mirrors. So we can think of our plane mirror as a very, very large circle, such as the radius is infinity, because the radius is so large that the mirror no longer appears curved, and it just appears as a straight line. So if we think about the radius as infinity, then we can also think about the focal length as infinity. And as we know, one over infinity is simply zero. And so all we have is zero equals one over zero equals one over the object distance plus one over the image distance, which gives us one over the object distance equals negative one over the image distance, which means that the object distance and the image distance are the same, except the image will be virtual. Here, I've just written out what I said in the last slide, that you can approximate a plane mirror as a kind of spherical mirror with an infinite radius. And so here you can see that for plane mirrors, the image distance equals negative object distance. Another important equation in this section is the equation for magnification, which defines the size of the object. So magnification is simply the ratio between the image distance and the object distance. So magnification is equal to negative i over o. And if we, for example, use this for a plane mirror, we could see that i equals negative o, and so this equation will come out to exactly one. And this makes a lot of sense because when you stand in front of a plane mirror and you look at it, then the magnification is exactly one, which means that the size of you in the mirror is the same as the size of you in person. A magnification that's greater than one will cause the object to appear bigger, and a magnification less than one will cause the object to appear smaller. So if something was one meter long and it had a magnification of two, then the image will appear two meters long. The sign of magnification is also important. So if magnification is positive, then the image is upright. So the fact that we got the result one for a plane mirror means that not only does the object not change size, but it also is upright. If the magnification comes out to be negative, the image will appear inverted. My favorite example of images being upright and inverted is when you think about looking at your reflection from the inside and from the outside of a spoon. So if we think about the inside of a spoon as being concave, which it is, we can use the equation 1 over f equals 1 over i plus 1 over o. The sign for the object is always going to be positive, and because we're on the inside now, the focal length will also be positive, and so will the image. And therefore, if all of these things are positive, then m equals negative i over o will give you a negative result. So this makes sense because when you look at yourself from the inside of a spoon, you appear inverted. In that example, I did just assume that the image distance was going to be positive, but to explain how I solve for that, which will also tell you whether the image is real or virtual, we're going to need to assign actual numbers to our focal length and to our object distance. So our focal length and our object distance are always going to be constants that we know for sure because you know how far you place the object and you know the curvature of the mirror. So we often only need to solve for the image distance. So if we say that the focal length is, let's say, 0 0.1 meters equals 1 over i plus, let's say, the object distance is 0 0.2 meters because the focal length for a spoon is often very small and you're often not going to be able to get close enough to the spoon um, in order to be closer than the focal length. Then we can say that this value is 10 inverse meters equals one over i plus five inverse meters. So one over i also equals five inverse meters. So i equals 0 0.2 meters as well. And so using these values of i equals 0 0.2 meters and also o equals 0 0.2 meters, we can see that we have a real image and that our magnification is going to be negative and therefore the image will be inverted. You can go through these same calculations to find out why if you manage to get close enough to the mirror so that you're closer than the focal length, then this image will be virtual and upright. And you can also go through these same equations for a convex mirror to figure out why for a convex mirror, um, the image will always be upright and virtual. The slide is a bit of a summary and a review of everything we learned about mirrors and also how to read and draw ray diagrams. So here I've written out all of the sign conventions for all of the variables that we use. And here I have three different images of mirrors. 
So I have three different options here. We're going to connect the dots to see which one is which. So in A, we can see that the object is very clearly further away than the focal length. Um, and therefore, we can say that this object is further than the focal point. So these connect. In B, we can see that O is here and F is here. And therefore, these are the same distance from the mirror. And so in picture B, the object is at the focal point. In the third image, we can see that the focal point is here and the object is here. So the object is clearly closer than the focal point. And now to see what kind of images are formed, we trace the rays that bounce back off of the mirror. So in this case, this ray heads this way and then bounces back this way, and this ray heads this way and then bounces back this way. You can see that they do intersect at the focal point. However, these rays are not going in the same direction, so an image is not really formed here. An image is formed here, back when these rays that are bouncing back off of the mirror happen to intersect. So this image will be um, inverted. You can see this from the ray diagram because this top ray is coming from the top of the object and this bottom ray is coming from the bottom of the object. But when they intersect, they intersect in such a way that they go in the reverse direction. And therefore this image just visually is going to be um, inverted. And it's also going to be real because the image is on the exact same side as the object. So. This image is going to be the option that says real, inverted, and magnified. You can assign actual numbers to these in order to calculate this out and see it for yourself. In our second example, we can see that after these rays bounce off of the mirror, they actually never converge. So no image is formed in this case. In our third image, we have that the rays bounce off, but they diverge in separate directions. However, if we're standing here and observing, we can see that these rays are coming from a specific point behind the mirror. And therefore, this image is going to be virtual and upright. I guess this was an important enough fact that I wrote it down. So diverging mirrors, which are convex mirrors, will only ever form virtual, upright, and reduced images. But this isn't something you need to memorize. The things that I think you need to memorize are the sign conventions for every single variable and the two equations that we used. This video is getting rather long, so I'm going to end part one here. Part two will be up later today, and thank you so much for watching.